Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel Physiology Learning. I am Dr. Ram. In today's topic, we are going to see the continuation of regulation of respiration. In the previous class, we saw about neural regulation of respiration. In this class, we will be seeing about the chemical control of respiration. So, coming to the subtopics, we will be discussing about the chemoreceptors that is primarily the central and peripheral chemoreceptors and in peripheral chemoreceptors, we have an important cell called glomus cell and we will see how the glomus cells get activated. Let's jump into the topic. First, coming to the chemical control of regulation. The name itself says, so basically any chemical changes in the body like the change in PCO2, PO2 and H plus ions, they greatly influence the respiration. We know that normal respiratory pattern is generated by the neural regulation. But these chemicals can modulate the effect of respiration. So, the chemicals involved are O2, CO2 and H+. Then these receptors are called as chemoreceptors because they are sensing the chemicals. That's why they are named as chemoreceptors. The chemoreceptors are generally divided into central chemoreceptors and peripheral chemoreceptors. The central chemoreceptors are also located in the medulla. Medulla is an exclusive region for respiration. So, it is also located in the medulla on the ventral surface of medulla. Now, coming to the peripheral chemoreceptors, they are called as aortic and carotid bodies which are located in the arch of aorta as the name indicates aortic bodies and carotid bodies are located in the bifurcation of the carotid. So, these are their locations. Then, coming to the central chemoreceptors. The central chemoreceptors are very fascinating features and Lots of MCQs has been asked in the central chemoreceptors. So, please pay attention. In the central chemoreceptors, the CO2 is the one which can cause the blood brain barrier. But does it stimulate the central chemoreceptor directly? The answer is no. Let's see the mechanism. So, the central chemoreceptors, they are permeable to CO2, but not permeable to H plus ions. So, what happens is this CO2 enters the central chemoreceptor region and usually they combine with water this is a universal reaction which then will form the carbonic acid which then splits into yes H plus and bicarbonate ions H plus and bicarbonate ions so this H plus ions is the one which is stimulating the central chemoreceptors see the fascinating thing even though the H plus ions does not enter the blood brain barrier directly, they indirectly somehow through the conversion of CO2 can get generated and they stimulate the central chemoreceptors and these chemoreceptors can then go on and stimulate the respiratory muscles. So, we have two different questions here. One is who does stimulate the central chemoreceptors? Here they are asking which exactly stimulates the central chemoreceptors. The answer is H plus. There is another question which is called the central chemoreceptors are sensitive to what changes in the blood. The options will be again H plus and CO2 will be there. Out of them, this H plus ions, even though they get generated loads of amount in the blood, can they cross the central chemoreceptors? The answer is no. So, the central chemoreceptors are sensitive to what changes in the blood? The central chemoreceptors are sensitive to CO2 changes in the blood. Now, let's revise this again. The central chemoreceptors are simulated by, yes, the answer is H plus, not CO2 because H plus ions only can stimulate the central chemoreceptors. Then the next question arises. The central chemoreceptors are sensitive to what changes in the blood? Yes, the sensitivity is to more to PCO2 changes or the option will be given CO2 changes. So, which gas is most responsible for respiratory drive? The gas is carbon dioxide because the central chemoreceptors are more efficient in influencing the respiratory rate. Now, coming to the other group of receptors that is our peripheral group of receptors, peripheral chemoreceptors. Here we have the carotid body and the aortic body. We have the aortic body over the arch of aorta and the carotid body over the bifurcation of common carotid. And whenever they get stimulated, they can get carried to the central nervous system through respective nerves. The carotid goes via the glossopharyngeal nerve 
and the aortic body goes via the vagus nerve but the final destination is same they will go on near the femur receptor regions in the central system and influence the other medullary neuron there is an interesting thing about the blood supply of peripheral chemo receptors let's see the peripheral chemo receptors has a tremendous amount of blood supply you would not have heard this for any other tissue it has the blood supply of around 2000 ml per 100 gram of tissue even though the tissue present there is very less if you convert it for a 100 gram of carotid body or an aortic body the blood supply they receive is 2000 ml which is tremendously huge in number and it is the maximum amount of blood supply for a tissue when you consider as a specific tissue this one has the maximum amount of blood supply and this takes only the dissolved oxygen as we have seen in transport of oxygen we have two forms one is the dissolved form another one is the hemoglobin bound form in this the dissolved oxygen is sufficient for supplying the, the peripheral chemoreceptors there is a disadvantage also to this process what is the disadvantage is there are some conditions where the tissue oxygen supply is very less but still the dissolved oxygen can be normal can these conditions stimulate this peripheral chemoreceptors no because their dissolved form is normal so the peripheral chemoreceptors are not stimulated the classical examples are one is the anemia in anemia what happens let's think in anemia only the hemoglobin bone oxygen is reduced the otherwise the dissolved oxygen is completely normal so what happens even in case of severe anemia the peripheral chemoreceptors are not stimulated in a similar manner another disease that is carbon monoxide poisoning what happens in carbon monoxide poisoning in this this carbon monoxide replaces the hemoglobin bound oxygen again see here the hemoglobin bound oxygen is only affected in both these conditions not the dissolved form so both these conditions cannot stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptors and these have been repeatedly asked in mcqs also now coming to the cells in the peripheral receptor the cells in the peripheral chemoreceptors are called as glomus cells and out of them we have two types the one is type 1 the another one is type 2 these type 1 are the cells which are the chemical sensing cells these type 1 are our chemical sensing cells these type 2 cells are nothing but a supporting cell they just support the type 1 cells these are our supporting cells so these type 1 cells has numerous vesicles and these will have the neurotransmitters that is being responsible for the peripheral chemoreceptors action and these are carried, uh, carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve and vagi as we see before so what is the most important stimuli for a peripheral chemoreceptors the most important stimuli for a central chemoreceptors was h plus ions here the most important stimuli is hypoxia hypoxia that is decrease in po2 the peripheral chemoreceptors also behave like a central chemoreceptors in one way that it is also sensitive to changes in the pco2 so what do we understand here that both central chemoreceptor as well as the peripheral chemoreceptors they are sensitive to pco2 changes but stimulated by different factors like h plus for the central and hypoxia for the peripheral now coming to the mechanism of activation of glomus cells how these glomus cells get activated these uh, glomus cells has a beautiful channel that channel is called as hypoxia sensitive potassium channels hypoxia sensitive potassium channels so the name itself shows us the indication the these potassium channels are normally permeable from the inner membrane to the outside so what happens is the positive ions keep on discharging from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell whenever there is an hypoxia what happens is the potassium ions tend to stay inside the cell so more and more positivity in the cell so what will happen it will lead to depolarization this depolarization will activate a specific channel that is our voltage sensitive calcium channel so because of this depolarization the voltage sensitive calcium channels are activated and calcium enters 
and in glomus one cells what we saw it had huge number of vesicles which are stored inside the cell and these vesicles will have the neurotransmitter as and when this calcium enters these neurotransmitters fuse with the membrane and they release the neurotransmitters now coming to the neurotransmitter question like which is the most abundant neurotransmitter released in the glomus cells previous years the answer was dopamine but recent additions of genom have changed the answer like the mechanism have changed and they have found another neurotransmitter that is atp so atp is given in the option that should be chosen first for the neurotransmitter that is released by the glomus cells so followed by dopamine which is followed by ACH. So the change here is ATP. So this is one again a potential MCQ. I hope it's clear. Now coming to the take home points. What we are seeing? The central chemoreceptors are stimulated by H plus ions. Whereas the peripheral chemoreceptors are stimulated by hypoxia. But what is common among them? Both of them are sensitive to changes in PCO2. And which is the major neurotransmitter released by the glomus cells? Just now we saw it is nothing but our ATP. And there are two conditions which cannot stimulate the peripheral receptors because the dissolved oxygen is completely normal in them. They are the anemia and the carbon monoxide poisoning. I hope it's clear. Thank you for listening. In the next video, we will see some of the updates of the regulations of respiration. Thank you.